Hello, welcome back to our ancient and medieval world history lectures. Uh, we're heading into the last few lectures of the semester, uh, and we're going to be turning back to the development of kingdoms and society in uh, later medieval Europe uh, up until the rise of the early modern period in the 1500s. When we left off looking at the medieval history of Western Europe, uh, we focused on competition between church and state in the road uh, leading up to the Crusades, and we looked at the development of certain Western European kingdoms, uh, especially the kingdoms of France and of England. Today we're going to pick that story back up again, starting in the later 1100s uh, and tracing the development uh, of French and English royal institutions and rivalry between their kingdoms uh, from roughly the 1150s uh, to about 1400. Uh, then over the next couple of classes, we're going to trace not only the rise of France as a great European power, uh, but also the emergence of Portugal and Spain as major powers in their own right uh, and rivals uh, for European dominance. So the first thing we need to think about, uh, we talked about the rise of uh, European uh, power in the lead up to the Crusades. Uh, we talked about the competition between the Pope and the European kings. Uh, by the 1100s, the Pope had managed to develop a crusading movement, uh, had managed to establish his authority uh, over the major kings of Western Europe uh, and draw large numbers of European knights into a uh, quasi-colonial movement in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the Crusades, of course, succeeded at first with the capture of Jerusalem in 1099 and the establishment of the Crusader states in the Levant. And one of the uh, aftermath, uh, one of the effects of this movement was the development uh, of an immense trading network stretching across the Mediterranean Sea uh, and linking the Western Mediterranean with the new crusader states. This helped to drive the rise of banking institutions in Italy and in other parts of the Mediterranean world, and it had ripple effects on the trade and the economies of the surrounding European kingdoms. We also talked about uh, the development of uh, better farming techniques and the increase in the food supply uh, during the 11th century. Uh, and that phenomenon continued as we go into the high Middle Ages. By the 1100s, the population of Europe's major cities was on the rise, uh, and large centers like Paris or London uh, were starting to be capable of housing many tens of thousands of residents. Uh, you have a growing uh, farming economy in the countryside that's increasingly capable uh, of shipping its uh, goods to centers uh, at greater and greater distances. Uh, and all of this allowed the emergence uh, of a vibrant European society, which is not unified by one central government, uh, not even uh, the power of the papacy, uh, but which still sees a great amount of prosperity uh, across most of Europe uh, by the year 1200. There are a number of important features that help to affect uh, later civilization that emerge in this period of European history. Not only the rise of Europe's banking institutions in the Italian city-states, uh, but especially in the uh, cities of Europe. Uh, cities such as Paris uh, start to have uh, opportunities for large-scale building to show off their increasing wealth and the rising power of their monarchs. Uh, this is the grand age of Gothic architecture, uh, and structures such as the famous Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris uh, are uh, begun in the middle of the 1100s. By the early 1200s, you see the rise of the university uh, as a major feature uh, of this new urban culture in Western Europe. The University of Paris, chartered by King Philip Auguste uh, in 1200, is one of the first great institutions of higher learning in Western Europe. Uh, and although this and other universities begin as church schools designed to train high clergy for participation uh, in uh, the administration of the church, uh, they quickly expand their offerings, uh, establishing colleges of medicine and of law, and starting to set up some of the foundations for a professional middle class in Europe's cities. Uh, in Europe's cities, you also see the rise uh, of guilds, uh, of uh, merchant uh, and craft businesses uh, that 
allow private initiative in the urban economy. Uh, and increasingly, uh, Europe's cities have rights and privileges and wealth that is driven not by the kings, not by the nobles, or even by the church, but by a rising urban middle class. Uh, and this is a feature which will continue to develop uh, as uh, Europe's kingdoms and cities uh, gradually modernize. Now, in terms of the kings and kingdoms, uh, one of the greatest rising powers in the high Middle Ages is the Kingdom of France. When we last looked at the French royal power, uh, we had noted their relative weakness uh, in the early Middle Ages. Uh, France had been uh, devastated in the Viking Wars of the 800s and early 900s. Uh, then a new monarchy, the uh, Capetian royal family, had arisen in the late 900s, uh, and they continued to reign for several centuries in high medieval France. You remember the Capetian kings that were limited to the territory directly around Paris at the beginning of their reign. Uh, and they faced the problem that they had very little actual control. They were essentially figurehead monarchs for much of the landmass of France. Uh, that had once, long before, uh, belonged to the Carolingian uh, dynasty. Under the Capetian kings in the 1000s, there are many regional nobles, uh, such as the Dukes of Aquitaine in the southwest, or Burgundy in the east, uh, or the Counts of Toulouse in the south, or the Dukes of Normandy and Counts of Flanders uh, in the north, who uh, essentially have just as much power or more power, have more land, castles, followers, and wealth than the actual king. The kings of France had to be practiced diplomats, playing the great nobles and landowners of France off against one another, uh, trying to make advantageous marriage alliances, trying to gain a castle here uh, and a manor there, uh, but always recognizing that they lack the power to collect taxes uh, across the entire French landmass. Uh, they lack the power to establish a uniform law code. Uh, justice was enforced by the local nobility, uh, regardless of the wishes of the kings. Now, this is the situation that would change over the course of the High Middle Ages, as the French monarchy matured uh, and came into its own territorial power. The greatest thorn in the side of the French Capetian kings was the Kingdom of England, uh, and its associated territories in the Duchy of Normandy, uh, or uh, the, the greater part of northern France. You remember that in 1066, Duke William the Conqueror, uh, the Duke of Normandy, uh, descended from Vikings who had settled on the French coasts, uh, he sailed across the English Channel, conquered England, uh, and made himself its king. Now, the Norman dukes uh, are located, the center of their power in Normandy is only 100 miles uh, away from Paris to the northwest. Uh, they're very close to the seat of French royal power, and yet they had more wealth, uh, more land at their disposal. Uh, and not only that, with the English crown, uh, they have equal status to the French kings. Uh, so increasingly, we see a series of wars throughout the 1100s developing between the French kings at Paris uh, and the English slash Norman rulers to the north uh, and northwest. Uh, and the French kings early on tend to be on the losing side of those wars. Uh, again and again, they make attempts to attack Normandy and reclaim certain castles as their own, uh, but the French uh, are limited in their manpower, uh, who are willing to rally to the side of the French king. Uh, and the English and Normans repeatedly beat them back. Now, uh, in the middle of the 1100s, uh, the French royal family uh, has it, it's probably its lowest moment uh, in this period in, in its rivalry with England. In the year 1152, King Louis VII of France uh, has divorced his wife. Uh, she is a very powerful and fascinating noblewoman named Eleanor of Aquitaine, uh, one of the brilliant minds and great land owners uh, of the French nobility. Uh, someone who has also patronized the arts. Uh, she is someone who is, among other things, responsible uh, for patronizing minstrels who spread the legends uh, of King Arthur, uh, Lancelot, and Guinevere uh, and the Knights of the Brown Table. Guinevere uh, 
uh, had married the King of France in a uh, arranged marriage uh, when she is uh, a, a very powerful heiress. Uh, her father had left her the territory of Aquitaine, which is an enormous uh, wealthy landmass. It's approximately one third of French territory, uh, the southwest uh, of France and, and most of the Atlantic seaboard. Uh, and Eleanor, uh, as ruler of all of this, controls dozens of castles. She has numerous knights at her disposal. Uh, she is a powerful feudal noble in her own right. Now again, she is married to Louis VII uh, for political reasons. Uh, the, they're trying to unite the French kingdom. Uh, and Louis hopes that he can increase French royal power through his wife's ownership uh, of this massive Western territory. The problem was uh, they didn't like each other. Uh, Eleanor and Louis uh, were a horrible mismatch uh, in personal terms. Uh, Louis was a younger son of the previous king who had never wanted to succeed to the throne. Uh, he had been destined for the church until his older brother, the crown prince, had a riding accident and broke his neck. Uh, and Louis was forced reluctantly to become king. Uh, he wanted to spend his days and nights in prayer. Eleanor wanted to spend her days uh, enjoying the, uh, the feasts and the fun uh, of royalty. Uh, she wanted to patronize the arts. Uh, she wanted to spend lots of time uh, with uh, famous glamorous nobles. Uh, and basically their, their marriage was a train wreck. Uh, the two of them tried to save their marriage, uh, like you do in the 12th century, by going on crusade together. Uh, they sailed together to the Holy Land during the Second Crusade, but this backfired horribly. The Second Crusade was a disaster, uh, and so was this attempt to salvage their marriage. Uh, on the way back, they were on such bad terms that they took separate ships. Uh, and when they returned to France, the church was unable to convince them to reconcile for the good of France, uh, and they decided to call the marriage off. Now, one of the factors in their uh, bad personal relationship was that Eleanor had not been able to have any sons with King Louis of France. Uh, and Louis blamed her for this personally, thought it was due to her feminine stubbornness, uh, and believed that she was sabotaging him by not properly doing her duty and giving an heir to the French kingdom. So in 1152, uh, Louis and Eleanor divorce. And before the year is out, six months after her divorce, Eleanor remarries first. And not just anyone. She marries uh, the French noble who is about to succeed to the throne of uh, Normandy and England, uh, a man who became King Henry II of England. Uh, so this is a slap in the face to the French king. It, it's a good revenge move after a high medieval divorce. Uh, you divorce the king of France, of course you're going to marry the king of England uh, in order to get back at him. But to make matters worse, Eleanor uh, promptly got pregnant uh, and gave birth to a son. Uh, and then, as soon as a few months had gone by after the birth, uh, she was pregnant again. She gave birth to another son, and then another, and then another. Ultimately, over the next decade, Eleanor bore four sons for the King of England. Uh, and not only that, her divorce from France separated her southwest French territories from the French kingdom and bestowed them on the English king uh, and Duke of Normandy. Uh, and what that means is that the French king is literally hemmed in by his arch enemy and his ex-wife, uh, who has married his arch enemy. Uh, he does not control any of the territory in northern France or in the western half of France. Uh, and uh, while he tries to uh, make war uh, again on Henry II, uh, Louis does not come off well in that conflict. So at this point, it looks as though England is poised to become the great power of Western Europe uh, in the second half of the 1200s. But family politics uh, have a way of, of taking uh, rapid and dramatic turns. Uh, and this is what happens. Uh, just when it looks like things couldn't get any worse for the French, uh, the marriage dynamics within the English royal family uh, take a bad turn. Uh, and ultimately, that plays into the hands of the French uh, and helps to play a part in the uh, French royal revival. So Henry and Eleanor, uh, the power couple in charge of England, Normandy, and Aquitaine, uh, had a very good marriage for about a decade or so. Uh, but then it started to go downhill. Uh, and uh, it went downhill very quickly uh, when uh, 
Henry bored of Eleanor uh, after she had done her duty and given birth to children. Uh, and as she started to uh, age uh, just a little bit, bit past her, her prime childbearing years, uh, Henry began to go through a series of mistresses. Uh, and uh, he began to grow increasingly upset uh, at Eleanor, who insisted on being treated as a noble equal uh, and playing her role uh, in uh, royal councils. Uh, they began to quarrel. Uh, and as their quarrels escalated, uh, eventually Henry of England locked his wife, uh, Eleanor, in a uh, dungeon uh, in a castle in France. Now, this dynamic then lasted and worsened over the next few decades, uh, over the, the later 1100s. Um, Henry did not divorce Eleanor. He, he kept her imprisoned for uh, a number of decades. Um, but would temporarily let her out. Uh, the royal family would get together and have Christmas dinner. Uh, and then uh, after a few days of uh, uh, release to visit with her kids, uh, Eleanor would be locked back up again. Uh, this drove a dynamic in which Henry and Eleanor's sons, uh, however, began to sympathize with their mother uh, and to hate their father, uh, as well as uh, sniping at each other. Now, uh, by the 1170s uh, and, and the early 1180s, uh, Helen, Henry and Eleanor's sons uh, are coming of age. Uh, in particular, their oldest son, Richard, uh, who was a famous chivalrous knight famed on the tournament circuit, uh, who would get the nickname of Richard the Lionheart, uh, and his younger brother, Prince John. Uh, if you recognize these names from Robin Hood legends of the Middle Ages, yes, those, those are uh, the, the characters who, who are floating around in the background uh, of the Robin Hood stories. Uh, so Richard and uh, John uh, do not get along well with their father, Henry. Richard, in particular, sympathizes with his mother. Uh, and gradually what you start to see are, are a series of on-again, off-again civil wars. Uh, as uh, Richard, in particular, rebels in his French castles against his father, Henry, uh, in order to try to fight on behalf of his mother, uh, Eleanor. Eleanor uh, also manages to slip messages out of her prison cell uh, and convince her ex, Louis of France, to lend aid to Richard against Henry. Uh, and by the 1180s, uh, as Henry is uh, getting older and, and uh, going through a series of illnesses, uh, the French start to recapture territory. Now, eventually, uh, Henry died. Richard the Lionheart, uh, Richard I, became the new king of England. Uh, Louis of France, meanwhile, had remarried a second wife, uh, and he had a son, Prince Philippe Auguste, uh, who then grew up and became the next king of France uh, after he died. In the late 1100s, England and France would attempt a reconciliation, uh, with Eleanor acting as a sort of mediator. King Richard of England and King Philip of France went together to the Holy Land to lead the Third Crusade, to try to retake Jerusalem after it fell into the hands of Saladin and the Muslims. Uh, however, they quarreled uh, on that crusade. Uh, they had a bad falling out. Um, Philip of France uh, pulled all of the French forces out of the crusade and went home. Uh, and King Richard uh, was forced to try to fight the crusade on his own. He was able to defeat Saladin in battle, but not to capture Jerusalem. Uh, and finally, he negotiated a compromise so that Christian pilgrims could visit the city, which would remain in Muslim hands. Uh, and then Richard went back uh, to his kingdom. On the way back, he got kidnapped um, on uh, the initiative of an Austrian prince who was allied with France. Uh, and Richard was held hostage for several years while England, uh, under his brother uh, John and his mother Eleanor, tried to raise a ransom for him. When he was finally released in a very bad mood, uh, Richard went back to England, uh, raised an army in England and Normandy and Aquitaine, and attacked the French. Uh, however, he is the sort of gallant medieval hero who liked to lead from the front lines, and while he was attempting to take one of King Philip's castles away from him, uh, Richard got shot in the head by a crossbow, uh, and this proved fatal. With Richard's death, the King of England uh, became John, uh, and John uh, goes down in history as one of the most incompetent monarchs uh, of the Middle Ages. Uh, he has the unfortunate nickname of John Lack Land for all of the territory that he lost in his disastrous wars against King Philip of France. Uh, 
Uh, when John comes to power, uh, he continues his brother's wars uh, against Philip Augustus, uh, but Philip Augustus, Philippe Auguste uh, of France, easily outmaneuvers King John. Uh, he recaptures vast numbers of French castles from the English and Normans, uh, and above all, in 1204, uh, Philippe Auguste led a huge army of French knights. They bring up massive siege weapons, including trebuchets, uh, and they recapture uh, the castles at the center of Normandy, uh, especially a great castle called the Chateau Gaillard uh, that uh, controls access to the uh, Lower Seine River Valley. With these victories, uh, the French essentially push the English out of Normandy uh, into the English Channel. Uh, the English keep Eleanor's territories in Aquitaine in the southwest, but they lose their other French land holdings. And Philippe Auguste uh, gains a great deal of territory and power. Uh, from this point, from the early 1200s on, through the 1200s, uh, this is a great century for the French crown. Uh, Philippe Auguste uh, starts uh, universities in Paris. Um, he gains a huge amount of control over the new French territories that he's captured. Uh, he starts to appoint royal officials to oversee justice and to supersede uh, local officials and local laws. So you start to see the beginning of a, a centralizing process in France where the king is actually in charge of other parts of the country. Uh, and above all, through the 1200s, the French kings begin claiming new rights of taxes uh, all over uh, the countryside of France. And increasingly they have the power, the castles and the men, to force local nobles to pay up. Uh, and to the more finances they gain control of, uh, the stronger they are. England uh, has a parallel period of weakness and decline for the monarchy, um, which is really uh, above all seen uh, in the famous uh, document called the Magna Carta, uh, issued in 1215. King John, uh, is not only disastrous in trying to defend England's territory from France, he also uh, makes enemies of uh, the church uh, and of the nobility and of the merchants in the cities like London uh, in England. Uh, he is an utter disaster uh, in his kingdom. He's both incompetent and tyrannical. Uh, and ultimately, all uh, walks of English society revolt against him uh, in 1215. Uh, the king is hemmed into a corner and actually forced to surrender uh, and sign a document that the nobles, the clergymen, uh, and representatives of the city merchants in England put in front of him. Uh, and this is the Magna Carta, or the Great Charter. The Magna Carta is a key moment in English legal and social history, uh, and it uh, sets the foundations for concepts of uh, legal rights. Uh, that ultimately underpin later English society and American society. Uh, a lot of the rights and privileges that we see uh, claimed in the era of the American Revolution go back to that medieval document. The Magna Carta uh, gives all sorts of freedoms uh, to English citizens, notably within the legal system. Uh, they can't be imprisoned without trial. Uh, they have a right of habeas corpus. They have a right to know uh, what charges are brought against them. Uh, above all, the king can't tax without consent. Uh, and this sets up the foundations uh, for the creation several decades later of a permanent body of English nobles and clerical and uh, merchant representatives uh, known as parliament. Uh, parliament, this concept of a legislative body with the power of the purse, uh, that the king has to ask permission before he can ask for any tax. Uh, and therefore, before he can fight wars, because you need money uh, in order to uh, pay and, and equip soldiers. Um, that idea of parliament is a permanent check on the power of English kings. Uh, and uh, again, its roots lie in the weakness of John uh, and the failures of the English against the French uh, in the early 1200s. Now, uh, another losing power in the Europe of the 1200s, uh, especially as we get towards the end of that century, uh, is the Catholic Church uh, and the power of the papacy. The popes of Rome uh, had been at the height of their power in the early Crusade era, uh, in the 1100s. Uh, the, the kings of Europe had basically bowed before their authority uh, and accommodated with them, given them the power to appoint bishops, um, 
given them, for the most part, freedom from taxation and interference in church lands uh, by secular monarchs. Uh, but by the 1200s, uh, that power of the church starts to be challenged again uh, by rising kings who are strong enough to do so. Uh, above all in France, uh, by the later 1200s, the French kings who were increasing their power of taxation start taxing church lands, uh, as well as those that belong to their nobles. Uh, the popes attempt to resist this. Uh, they attempt to say that, that only the church can take revenues from church lands, but increasingly the, the French kings have the power to ignore church protests. This uh, reaches a climax in the early 1300s. In the year 1309, there's an extensive dispute between the pope and the king of France. Uh, the popes attempt to excommunicate the kings of France to try to get the king to stop taxing church lands. And in response, in 1309, uh, the king of France sends French knights over the Alps into Italy and they kidnap the pope uh, and drag the elderly pope back to France and force him to back down on his challenge to the French monarchy. Uh, the pope died soon thereafter uh, and intimidated by the power of France, uh, French uh, or, or uh, church uh, officials have an election for the new pope uh, and they end up electing a French bishop uh, or cardinal uh, as the, the new head of the Catholic Church. This new French cleric moves the center of the Catholic Church from Vatican City in Ro Rome to the city of Avignon uh, in France. Uh, and from 1309 to 1377, uh, the Catholic Church is now based in Avignon. Uh, now, this works very well for the French. Uh, again, it goes along with the height of French uh, medieval power. Uh, but on the other hand, it diminishes the power of the Catholic Church. And increasingly, as France fights wars against England and other European powers, uh, those who are not French begin to perceive the Catholic Church no longer as a genuine spiritual body of leadership, but more as a partisan body uh, that does whatever its French puppet masters tell it. Uh, and so the Avignon papacy is, is uh, a period uh, of weakness in church authority, and you start to see intellectual challenges uh, to the church, uh, which lay some of the theological underpinnings for the later Protestant Reformation. Now, the 1300s uh, are not as uh, good a century for France or, or anywhere else in Europe. Uh, a famous history of this uh, period has referred to it as the calamitous 14th century. Uh, and this is because of a number of things that, that uh, start in the 1330s and then especially the 1340s. Uh, during the 1330s, uh, you have a new phase in the violent rivalry between France and England. Uh, the English kings uh, have had a century of humiliation at the hands of the French. Uh, they've tried to make up for this by attacking countries on their Celtic fringe, uh, by conquering Wales and parts of Ireland and Scotland. Uh, the Scotland part didn't work so well that the Scots rebel and fight back and establish a powerful independent monarchy under Robert the Bruce uh, in the early 1300s. But the English monarchs uh, basically take out massive financial loans from Italian bankers in order to pay for large armies uh, that Parliament won't pay for through taxation. And in 1337, the King of England named Edward III uh, launches a bold new war against the French. Uh, in that year, there's a uh, royal succession. Uh, power passes uh, out of the hands uh, of the, the old line of the Capetian royal family uh, and into a, the hands of a cousin of the royal family named Philip VI. Due to various marriage alliances, uh, there's French royal blood also within the English royal family tree. Uh, and Edward III of England uh, makes the bold claim that he should also get to be king of France. Uh, he still has lands in Aquitaine, uh, and in 1337, he brings English soldiers into France, tries to reclaim northern France for England, and actually claims that he should be the ruler of the entire French monarchy and nobility. The French, of course, uh, refuse to accept this, uh, don't give this any validity. This begins a bloody conflict known as the Hundred Years' War, which in fact lasts for more than 100 years, uh, until 1453. Now, in its early phases, uh, the English win, win some surprising victories. Uh, they destroy a French fleet in the Channel uh, in 1340. Uh, English 
uh, armies land in France, raid and devastate the countryside, murder peasants and burn and loot uh, and take some Norman cities. Uh, and they managed to destroy armies of French knights in 1346 and 1356, uh, especially through the massed use of archery. Uh, the French are fighting with huge cavalry charges of knights. Uh, the English find that they can arm peasant archers with longbows uh, with very high rates of fire. Their bows uh, fire powerful arrows that can penetrate armors, uh, armor, and they, they slaughter uh, the charging French nobles. Now, the French... Uh, take massive losses, but the English aren't strong enough to capture Paris and the center of the kingdom. Uh, and this starts to develop into a brutal uh, and stalemated war. In 1347, uh, Europe also experiences the sudden terrifying pandemic uh, of bubonic and pneumonic plague, known as the Black Death. Uh, we've already mentioned that this has been raging along some of the trade routes uh, reaching from China and the Mongol Khanates uh, through the Middle East. Uh, that this is devastating Mamluk Egypt and its empire uh, from 1347 on. Uh, it simultaneously follows the trade across the Mediterranean, uh, hits Italy, uh, and then spreads like wildfire through southern Europe and then across all of Europe from 1347 to 1351. Uh, you can read the statistics and all sorts of grim and gruesome plague accounts in this age of pandemic. I don't think we need to go into massive detail uh, on these symptoms. Um, what is key to know is that the plague devastates European society. It, it reverses a couple of centuries of large-scale population growth. It kills between 30% and 50% uh, of the people in uh, the European continent. Uh, both France and England and all of the surrounding European powers, large and small, are devastated uh, by the outbreak. The social consequences uh, are uh, enormous. Uh, beyond the massive loss of life, uh, we see uh, popular religious movements uh, growing, trying to avert the wrath of God. Uh, of course, medical science is unable to stop uh, this plague without antibiotics. There's nothing uh, they can do to stop the, the spread of this um, through infected fleas uh, and rats, which easily can slip past uh, quarantine boundaries. Um, so mass religious movements such as the flagellant movement, uh, people who leave cities and wander the countryside beating each other with whips uh, and uh, calling for penitence in mass social grouping. Uh, obviously, these actually further spread the disease and, and mass panic and violence that goes with it. There are outbreaks of religious violence uh, and large-scale massacres of Jewish minority communities in Europe's cities uh, by panicked Christian groups uh, who look for scapegoats to blame for the horror inflicted on them. Uh, eventually, the plague would subside, but would then cycle back and hit again and again in repeated outbreaks through the rest uh, of the Middle Ages. One of the phenomena though, that we see in the aftermath of the plague uh, is uh, a gradual increase in mobility in Europe's society for the survivors, um, those who don't die in the massive dieouts of the bubonic plague find that there are more job opportunities. Um, that with the population massively decreased, um, the food supply from the farms in the countryside is actually sufficient to feed the people who are left and produce surpluses. Um, there are greater opportunities for peasants to leave the farms where they've been bound for generations uh, and move into towns. Uh, there are new jobs and higher wages, again, for those who are left alive to take them. One of the greatest areas of hope in the aftermath of the, the horror of the Black Death uh, is in the city-states of uh, Renaissance Italy. Uh, you will see a, a period of massive social rebirth and economic revival in Italy a few decades after uh, the plague had devastated Italian cities. Uh, the banking industry uh, rebounds by the late 1300s, um, but above all, you have a new social uh, confidence and social mobility for a growing middle class. Uh, there's a greater sense uh, of social opportunities for people who are not nobles, uh, but people uh, can get ahead through education uh, and through jobs. Uh, there's a greater spirit of humanism, uh, advances in the arts and in literature. Uh, the invention of the printing press in the 1400s uh, would further increase a, a surge in writing and in literacy uh, 
uh, in Italy and then in, in other parts of Europe. Uh, so there is hope in the wake uh, of pandemics uh, even more horrible than those uh, which we are currently going through uh, ourselves. Uh, thank you for your attention, uh, and that's all for today's lecture. Uh, in our last couple of lectures, we're going to finish out the story of late medieval England and France uh, and think about the rise of Portugal and Spain.